Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm awesome. How are you today? I am great. So I want to talk about Vape, your recent project, which has won an award. Tell us a little bit about it, about the award it won, and what inspired this project. So uh, Vape won Best New Work through Broadway World, um, which is really cool. It is a it's a it's a sketch comedy um, adaptation of Greece. Um, and I play the lead Sandy, so there's a lot of singing, there's a lot of dancing, which I am not necessarily versed in either of those. So that was part, I mean, I guess that lends itself to part of the sketch of the comedy, too. Um, so we performed several times uh, on stage throughout different parts of Georgia, and I guess it just caught wind, and we were just nominated Best New Work, and it did really well, and we were... Um, invited to go to New York to perform that as well, but that didn't happen, and we won't get into that. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was a great time. It was very funny. Yeah, it was awesome. What was it like getting into kind of the musical theater aspect of things for you? So going back to my childhood, um, I was raised in the private Catholic school system, and we were taking like course and kindergarten, you know, so that was like day one and performing musicals on stage. Uh, so I've been doing that for a while, uh, skipped to high school, took a couple theater classes, college didn't really get into it that much. And then here we are now. And, and so performing vape was the first time for me in a while doing both of those things. Um, so I don't necessarily come from like a musical theater background. I've, there's been just certain aspects of my life where I've been forced to, not forced to do it, happily to do that. Um, but even with vape, we had to take music lessons and that was kind of uh, interesting because it's like, you know, you're just doing your best, but like, like the, um, what's the word for the, the music conductor? Um, you know, was was just kind yeah. of honest the whole time. And I was just like, oh, I did not, like, I'm taking it seriously, but like I had to hit a certain note where I like hadn't been trained to hit a certain note. So it was just like, I don't know, it's just kind of stressful, honestly. But it was fun. It was fun, nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah, difficult. But do you think it's something that you'll maybe pursue more in the future? I mean, it would be amazing to, you know, I'd have to like take voice lessons and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be, you know, you always want to put your, I always want to put myself out there and try new things. So yeah, I'm open to it. I mean, I've had to sing for different auditions and I'm sure my agent's like, okay, we're not going to pass that on, but thank you so much for sending. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm open to it for sure in the future. Yeah. It's the try that counts for sure. Yes. <laughs> um, so what's really interesting to me is that you, um, have an ancestry that is Jamaican and you grew up part-time in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do you feel that it's helped you or hurt you in any way when it comes to auditioning for roles? I, I tend not to think about the word um, hurt in a way that's like working necessarily against me. I just think that it is what it is. And at the end of the day, um, their choice is out of my control. But as far as um, the hurt that you're speaking of, I okay, so it's it's very strange because I am of Jamaican descent, but I was raised in the private Catholic school system, so I speak very well, and I don't carry that accent. Like if you hear my parents, they sound like the bobsled team, but then here I am, and I sound very proper. Um, so in a way, me speaking in a way that's very articulate has uh, hurt me or uh, kind of put a hurdle in certain auditions, but also in a way. Um, I, I feel like it's definitely um, helped having that upbringing and being able to uh, kind of rely on that in certain character roles or um, just bringing that kind of story to the audition or the piece has been helpful. You know, neither one of my parents were in the system, like straight up from Jamaica, like, want the American dream for their kids, brought us to High Point, North Carolina of all places, uh, which is a small town. Furniture capital of the world, fun fact, not a lot of people know that, um, but you know, a lot of my Jamaican friends, you know, they were, you know, Brooklyn or Florida or even England, you know, um, but no, High Point, North Carolina, and it is what it is, and, uh, you know, they worked a lot, so my parents were barely home, 
And so I took an interest in acting and modeling at a young age and my mom, you know, did her best. And I was just, you know, I was very adamant at a young age just to get involved into this industry. I didn't really know what it was. I loved performing. My parents were always gone. So my brother and sister and I were playing Michael Jackson and Madonna and lip syncing and dancing. We were left to our own demise and we we're just dancing and singing and just being crazy. And I think that that's where it started for me. And, uh, when I got older and I, I was out on my own and I worked, I worked between CNN and TBS uh, for a while. Then I had a full-time job at, at Turner Broadcasting here in Atlanta. And, you know, my parents were like, this is great, you know, but they were just so happy for me. And I had insurance and I had benefits, but I was miserable. I was miserable. It wasn't my passion, you know. I eventually left and my parents were like, what are you doing, Mom? You know, you, you know, they paid for your education. Like, why, 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 like, why, like, why are you going to go join the circus? That's kind of like their mindset because they don't really understand it. Um, but when they started seeing me, you know, doing what I love and, you know, seeing me on TV and like, oh, that's my daughter, you know, I think that that's when it kind of changed for them. So it's so interesting because we, I talk often in my podcast about how you really have to have a passion for what you're doing when it comes to entertainment. It's not an industry that people get in for fun and the people who get in it for fun, you see that they fizzle out quickly. You know, people think that they can move to Hollywood when they're 18 and make it big as an actress. And you find out quickly that that's not true. And those who end up making it are usually the ones who have no plan B. You know, this is the only thing that makes them happy as far as career. And they really have to push hard for it. Um, and, you know, when we talk about acting and modeling and things like that, it's not just this overarching, I want to be in entertainment. It's a very specific, I want to act. I want to perform. You know, I want to interview. I want to be in broadcast media, in front of the camera, things like that. I also think it's interesting and should be noted for those who have never auditioned for something that oftentimes when you're auditioning, there is a type that is cast. So, you know, you're able to audition even if you don't necessarily fit the type if your agent sends it to you mm -hmm. but often you might be overlooked if you don't hit certain criteria um you know just for those who have an audition before it's not like when you're watching a movie on tv and you see the lead you're like oh anybody auditioned for this and this person got it no mm -hmm. you know usually it's sent to very specific people within the agency um that they think would fit best for the role and that can come down to accents or skin color or, you know, things like that, which is unfortunate um, because it cuts off a lot of talent. But at the same time, the producers, the directors have a vision for what they want and yeah. they're looking for that specifically. I, I can relate to that a lot. Nobody in my family is in entertainment whatsoever. Oh, yeah. Um, everybody in my family is in fashion, which is, you know, what I thought I was going to do initially just because I grew up with it. But it, it's similar to what you said. I did it because I kind of thought this is stable for me since I have so many connections, but I don't love it. You know, I don't love it. And I think that it would be hard to work a nine to five doing, producing a product that I'm not super passionate about. Yeah. I had absolutely no idea. Like I had absolutely no, like there was there was nothing guaranteed. There's not there's there wasn't like oh I'm leaving this because this has come through. Um, I on Monday I'm gonna you know be on set for this. There was none of that. If anything, I was kind of I wouldn't say reckless in a bad way. I wouldn't use it like in a negative kind of uh, background. But I left. I, I was just like it's definitely not this. It's more so this. I'm going to live my life, make the net, net, network, make the connections, and then go. And I didn't even get into acting almost immediately. Like, I did the behind-the-scenes stuff just because I was like, you know what? It wasn't even like, let me know all let me know all the things in front of the camera behind the camera it was just like let me get involved in the industry yeah let me get involved and the first thing i got involved with was um <laughs> are you smarter than a fifth grader with Jeff? oh my Fox. gosh i don't even know if you remember that but that, i do you were wow you're in atlanta yes and so i was working i was a pa for that which is like i wouldn't even put it down a lot of yes it's not the most glamorous position but it's also a position that I didn't want to stay in, which was fine, but I learned so much and uh, it was a helpful tool, just like everything. And it's, it's, uh, 
I recently had lunch with uh, Justin Bieber's uh, production uh, set designer and uh, he was telling me that he was dumb enough to say yes. And so I've always kind of taken that with me just because uh, I feel like that's kind of been me in a lot of circumstances. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't even think about saying it was I was dumb enough to say yes. I think that I was just like, yeah. let's try it out. I have a quote that sticks out to me. It's actually, I saw it recently from Jim Carrey. He was talking about his father who was could have been a great comedian, but was too scared to try. Have you heard this quote? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Probably maybe. Let's he, hear it. He was too scared to try to become a comedian, so he became like just some regular job and ended up getting laid off and they lost everything. Uh, and Jim Carrey says, you can fail at what you don't love, so you might as well try at what you do love. Yeah. And that's exactly what you did, you know, and it seems that it's worked out for you, which is a perfect transition to my next question, because you're talking about how initially you didn't have work and you were kind of behind the scenes doing PA stuff, but now you have an extensive portfolio. You've worked on projects like Greenleaf, The Resident, Pitch Perfect, Dynasty, The Vampire Diaries, Teen Wolf, Finding Carter. Are you reading, it, you have to be reading this off or you just did your homework? I just did my homework. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so many more that I haven't even named because that was the max amount I could fit into my brain without messing up. <laughs> <laughs> Which one had a time that was the most memorable on set? So funny, funny one memorable is me being uh, killed by a giant lizard on Teen Wolf. And that was my first job. George Pierre, casting director here in Atlanta, Georgia, booked me on that. That like that was just so awesome. MTV, you know, I got to, it's it's um the episode's called Raving. It's season two, episode eight. Some in like this little elevator with slabs, and they're having to get their like tickets through like the slabs. And I'm like, I my two bodyguards and stuff like that. And there's another scene where I'm like, you know, just running the show at, at underground club scene, and all the, like the characters from Team Wolf are down there dancing and you know being human, but then turning into vampires and shit. And so. Uh, one of the one of the humans who turn into I can't remember what it's called, but he like morphs into like this giant lizard costume thing, and they have con contacts, and they put like green shit in his mouth. So, anyways, he attacks me, and there's like green goo coming out, and I hadn't been trained to die. It was what he's a like this human in this lizard costume attacks me with his like, just think of like Barney, <laughs> but not, but the kind of vibe or like. You know, you're in like this bloated costume and you're evil looking. And they got all the special effects later on. But like he attacks me and I'm like, <clears throat> like it's my first time dying and I'm watching it and I'm like, oh my God, that's fucking awful. Um, so that was memorable because I had never been killed before or by a lizard. But one of the, the most magical experiences for me was... I worked with Barry Jenkins on the Underground Railroad. As you know, if Beale Street could talk, Moonlight, amazing human being, he's just, he he's like you, you're like one of my friends, you know, you're my friend now, if you didn't know that, by the way. So he was just, you know, highly acclaimed, brilliant human being. I had, uh, it's a period piece too, and I think that that was the first period piece that I had worked on. As, as an African-American female, you can expect that in your Rolodex, like, this is just what it is. Um, so it was, one of, it was the first period piece that I'd worked on. And um, I was flying out to go to New York the next day to do vape in New York, which we ended up not doing, but I'd already booked my tickets. So we were already going to go as a group. So I was flying out the next day to New York, but they needed me to come to Savannah for the fitting the day before. So I had to do an eight hour round trip to go get fitted. And so they're like, we need you here because these pieces are just so intricate. We need like exact measurements. So they're sizing me up, literally. Um, and these, these costumes are just, oh gosh, they're just, they're beautiful. They're elegant. Um, how to wear a corset and like, oh, like everything to the deep, like, every, like it took forever to get dressed, everything underneath. Um, and by the time I got there, I guess Barry had already left. It's time for my first scene. And I'm with the cast. We're hanging out. And then I finally see Barry walking by. And I'm like, oh, my God, there he is. I get a chance to, like, say hello. Thank you so much for having me. So we're talking, and I see that he sees us. And I don't want to, like, interrupt him because, like, you know, live your life, whatever. We'll talk at some point. 
he stops and he's like, hey, uh, I don't know if he remembered my name at that point in time, Andrea, maybe Miss Lang, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said, um, thanks for being here. You had one of the best auditions I've ever seen. But aside from that, it was memorable because, uh, A, it's Underground Railroad. It's an adaptation from a Pulitzer Prize winning book by Colson Whitehead. There's just so many elements to it that make it so meaningful and important. And not only that, but working with Barry. Turns out he's just a human and he does good work. And I read something somewhere where it was something along the lines of like, once you climb the ladder, it's up to you to bring it down to others. And that to me was so important because I, I feel like I do, I feel like I, without any gain, I feel like I try to do that for my friends. Um, because if you, if you could feel in another example, if you can feel so good about yourself and your circumstances and your life, then your whole being is going to just be good. You're going to resonate positive. You're going to be flying high, you know? So why wouldn't I want to make you feel as good? Why can't we all feel as good? Then there's going to be, you know, less negative shit going on, you know? So it's just like, it's your duty to help others out. This is a common um, theme that I hear from my interviewees. You know, I was recently interviewing Megan Brodigum about Mind Hunter, and um, she was talking about David Fincher, who has done massive movies, like oh, iconic movies. And it's funny because I think a lot of people would assume that these big names don't care about, you know, who's under them. Mm -hmm. But it's ironic because those who produce and direct and create these movies that make it so big mm -hmm. usually do. They usually yeah. do care. And that's actually what shows through your screen and why the movie resonates with you so much. You have to care about your cast and your crew for the, for the film to come together the right way. I, we also talk on the podcast a lot about helping others and giving back. I find that many who are in this industry feel the same way that you do, where it is kind of your duty to help those climb the ladder. You know, you understand because you were there once too, and a mentor helped you, or you wish a mentor had helped you and you think of the ways that they could. So you turn and you be that mentor for others. Oh, for sure. But in a strange turn of a question, I like to kind of wrap up with something fun. And I know that you play harmonica, which many people might not know. So talk to us about what got you into playing the harmonica. <laughs> so um, I, this goes back to like, you know, when my parents were at, you work working all day long and I was left with my siblings and we were going crazy and dancing and singing to Michael Jackson and Madonna. I was gifted my first harmonica as a kid. And um, when my dad would pick up my mom from work and I would go inside sometimes and she was a nurse and I would just bring it with me and she's like, she would be, she wouldn't be upset, but she'd be like, what are you doing with that? Stop playing that, it's at my job. So I started playing it and uh, everyone started loving it. So it just kind of became my thing that I would do um, at the nursing home, like every Friday. So that was like, that was probably my first job as a kid. So that's, that's where it started. And now I just do it for fun. I'm not performing professionally anywhere like that, but I probably, I mean, I probably should look into it, but um yeah, it's just it's just for fun. I listen to songs and I kind of mimic the tone, the tone and the tune, and that's where I like have fun with it. Yeah, that's a sweet story that you played at nursing homes. I love that. <laughs> um, listen, I like to end on a positive note. I always ask my guests to bring something fun to cheers to. What kind of positive news do you have to share? If you have the opportunity to help other people, please do so because this is one quote. This is one quote that I actually tell my friends, not constantly, but most of my friends knows about me. This is a quote that I say, you're going to die one day. You're like, say something positive, Andrea. And it is, I'm going somewhere with this. You are going to die one day. 
So let that be the fire beneath you to remind you that every day is so worth it. And if you're not in awe every day, then you're clearly missing the picture. You really are. You have the opportunity to take this opportunity to just do something with your day. It's that simple, you know? Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a total pleasure to talk to you. You're so sweet and so fun. Yeah, you too.